Chapter Three of Brother Jacob. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Brother Jacob by George Eliot. Chapter Three. Perhaps it was a result quite different from your expectations that Mr. David Foe should have returned from the West Indies only a few years after his arrival there and have set up in his old business like any plain man who has never travelled. But these cases do occur in life, since, as we know, men change their skies and see new constellations without changing their souls. It will follow sometimes that they don't change their business under those novel circumstances Certainly this result was contrary to David's own expectations He had looked forward you are aware to a brilliant career among the blacks But either because they had already seen too many white men or for some other reason They did not at once recognize him as a superior order of human being Besides there were no princesses among them Nobody in Jamaica was anxious to maintain David for the mere pleasure of his society and those hidden merits of a man which are so well known to himself were as little recognized there as they notoriously are in the effete society of the old world so that in the dark hints that David threw out at the oyster club about that life of sultanic self-indulgence spent by him in the luxurious Indies I really think he was doing himself a wrong I believe he worked for his bread and in fact took to cooking as after all the only department in which he could offer skilled labor he had formed several ingenious plans by which he meant to circumvent people of large fortune and small faculty but then he never met with exactly the right circumstances David's devices for getting rich without work had apparently no direct relation with the world outside him as his confectionery receipts had it is possible to pass a great many bad half pennies and bad half crowns But I believe there has no instance been known of passing a halfpenny or a half crown as a sovereign a Sharper can drive a brisk trade in this world It is undeniable that there may be a fine career for him if he will dare consequences But David was too timid to be a sharper or venture in any way among the man traps of the law he dared rob nobody but his mother and so he had to fall back on the genuine value there was in him to be content to pass as a good halfpenny or to speak more accurately as a good confectioner for in spite of some additional reading and observation there was nothing else he could make so much money by nay he found in himself even a capability of extending his skill in this direction and embracing all forms of cookery while in other branches of human labor he began to see that it was not possible for him to shine fate was too strong for him he had thought to master her inclination and had fled over the seas to that end but she caught him tied an apron round him and snatching him from all other devices made him devise cakes and patties in a kitchen at kingstown he was getting submissive to her since she paid him with tolerable gains but fevers and prickly heat and other evils incidental to cooks in ardent climates made him long for his native land so he took ship once more carrying his six years savings and seeing distinctly this time what were fate's intentions as to his career if you question me closely as to whether all the money with which he set up at grimworth consisted of pure and simple earnings i am obliged to confess that he got a sum or two for charitably abstaining from mentioning some other people's misdemeanors altogether since no prospects were attached to his family name and since a new christening seemed a suitable commencement of a new life mr david foe thought it as well to call himself mr edward freely but lo now in opposition to all calculable probability some benefit appeared to be attached to the name of david foe should he neglect it as beneath the attention of a prosperous tradesman it might bring him into contact with his family again and he felt no yearnings in that direction 
Moreover, he had small belief that the something to his advantage could be anything considerable. On the other hand, even a small gain is pleasant, and the promise of it in this instance was so surprising that David felt his curiosity awakened. The scale dipped at last on the side of writing to the lawyer, and, to be brief, the correspondence ended in an appointment for a meeting between David and his eldest brother at Mr. Strutt's, the vague something having been defined as a legacy from his father of eighty-two pounds three shillings. David, you know, had expected to be disinherited, and so he would have been, if he had not, like some other indifferent sons, come of excellent parents, whose conscience made them scrupulous, where much more highly instructed people often feel themselves warranted in following the bent of their indignation. Good Mrs. Foe could never forget that she had brought this ill-conditioned son into the world, when he was in that entirely helpless state which excluded the smallest choice on his part, and, somehow or other, she felt that his going wrong would be his father's and mother's fault, if they failed in one tittle of their parental duty. Her notion of parental duty was not of a high and subtle kind, but it included giving him his due share of the family property. And when a man had got a little honest money of his own, was he so likely to steal? To cut the delinquent son off with a shilling was like delivering him over to his evil propensities. No, let the sum of twenty guineas which he had stolen, be deducted from his share, and then let the sum of three guineas be put back from it, seeing that his mother had always considered three of the twenty guineas as his. And, though he had run away, and was perhaps gone across the sea, let the money be left to him all the same, and be kept in reserve for his possible return. Mr. Foe agreed to his wife's views, and made a codicil to his will accordingly, in time to die with a clear conscience. But for some time his family thought it likely that David would never reappear, and the eldest son, who had the charge of Jacob on his hands, often thought it a little hard that David might perhaps be dead, and yet, for want of certitude on that point, his legacy could not fall to his legal heir. But in this state of things the opposite certitude, namely, that David was still alive and in England, seemed to be brought by the testimony of a neighbour, who, having been on a journey to Cattleton, was pretty sure he had seen David in a jig, with a stout man driving by his side. He could swear it was David, though he could give no account why, for he had no marks on him, but no more than a white dog, and that didn't hinder folks from knowing a white dog. It was this incident which had led to the advertisement. The legacy was paid, of course, after a few preliminary disclosures as to Mr. Davy's actual position. He begged to send his love to his mother, and to say that he hoped to pay her a dutiful visit by and by. But, at present, his business and near prospect of marriage made it difficult for him to leave home. His brother replied with much frankness. My mother may do as she likes about having you to see her, but for my part I don't want to catch sight of you on the premises again. When folks have taken a new name, they'd better keep to their new quinitance. David pocketed the insult along with the eighty-two pounds three, and travelled home again in some triumph at the ease of a transaction which had enriched him to this extent. He had no intention of offending his brother by further claims on his fraternal recognition, and relapsed with full contentment into the character of Mr. Edward Freely, the orphan, scion of a great but reduced family with an eccentric uncle in the west indies i have already hinted that he had some acquaintance with imaginative literature and being of a practical term he had you perceive applied even this form of knowledge to practical purposes it was little more than a week after the return from his fruitful journey that the day of his marriage with penny having been fixed it was agreed that mrs palfrey should overcome her reluctance to move from home, and that she and her husband should bring their two daughters to inspect little Penny's future abode, and decide on the new arrangements to be made for the reception of the bride. Mr. Freely meant her to have a house so pretty and comfortable 
but she need not envy even a wool factor's wife of course the upper room over the shop was to be the best sitting room but also the parlor behind the shop was to be made a suitable bower for the lovely penny who would naturally wish to be near her husband though mr freely declared his resolution never to allow his wife to wait in the shop the decisions about the parlor furniture were left till last because the party was to take tea there and about five o'clock they were all seated there with the best muffins and buttered buns before them little penny blushing and smiling with her crop in the best order and a blue frock showing her little white shoulders while her opinion was being always asked and never given she secretly wished to have a particular sort of chimney ornaments but she could not have brought herself to mention it seated by the sight of her yellow and rather withered lover who though he had not reached his thirtieth year had already crow's feet about his eyes she was quite tremulous at the greatness of her lot in being married to a man who had travelled so much and before her sister letty the handsome letitia looked rather proud and contemptuous thought her nature brother-in-law an odious person and was vexed with her father and mother for letting penny marry him dear little penny she certainly did look like a fresh white heart cherry going to be bitten off the stem by that lipless mouth would no deliverer come to make a slip between that cherry and that mouth without a lip quite a family likeness between the admiral and you mr freely observed mrs palfrey who was looking at the family portrait for the first time it's wonderful and only a grand-uncle do you feature the rest of your family as you know of i can't say said mr freely with a sigh my family have mostly thought themselves too high to take any notice of me at this moment an extraordinary disturbance was heard in the shop as of a heavy animal stamping about and making angry noises and then of a glass vessel falling in shivers while the voice of the apprentice was heard calling master in great alarm mr freely rose in anxious astonishment and hastened into the shop followed by the four palfreys who made a group at the parlour door transfixed with wonder at seeing a large man in a smock frock with a pitchfork in his hand rush up to mr freely and hug him crying out zavy zavy brother zavy it was jacob and for some moments david lost all presence of mind he felt arrested for having stolen his mother's guineas he turned cold and trembled in his brother's grasp why how's this said mrs palfrey advancing from the door who is he jacob supplied the answer by saying over and over again i zacob bother zacob come o zee zavy till hunger prompted him to relax his grasp and to seize a large raised pie which he lifted to his mouth by this time david's power of device had begun to return but it was a very hard task for his prudence to master his rage and hatred towards poor jacob i don't know who he is he must be drunk he said in a low tone to mr palfrey but he's dangerous with that pitchfork he'll never let go then checking himself on the point of betraying too great an intimacy with jacob's habits he added you watch him while I run for the constable and he hurried out of the shop Why where do you come from my man said mr. Palfrey speaking to Jacob in a conciliatory tone Jacob was eating his pie by large mouthfuls and looking round at the other good things in the shop while he embraced his pitchfork with his left arm and laid his left hand on some bath buns he was in the rare position of a person who recovers a long absent friend and finds him richer than ever in the characteristics that won his heart i zacob brother zacob tome i love zavy brother davy he said as soon as mr palfrey had drawn his attention zavy came back from zindy's got mother zinnies where's zavy he added looking round and then turning to the others with a questioning air puzzled by david's disappearance it's very odd observed mr palfrey to his wife and daughters he seemed to say freely's his brother come back from the indies what a pleasant relation for us said letitia sarcastically 
I think he's a good deal like Mr. Freely. He's got just the same sort of nose, and his eyes are the same colour. Poor Penny was ready to cry. But now Mr. Freely re-entered the shop without the constable. During his walk of a few yards, he had had time and calmness enough to widen his view of consequences. And he saw that to get Jacob taken to the workhouse or to the lock-up house as an offensive stranger might have awkward effects if his family took the trouble of inquiring after him. He must resign himself to more patient measures. On second thoughts, he said, beckoning to Mr. Palfrey and whispering to him while Jacob's back was turned, he's a poor, half-witted fellow. Perhaps his friends will come after him. I don't mind giving him something to eat and letting him lie down for the night. He's got it into his head that he knows me. They do get these fancies, idiots do. He'll perhaps go away in an hour or two and make no more ado. I'm a kind-hearted man myself. I shouldn't like to have the poor fellow ill-used. Why, he'll eat a sovereign's worth in no time, said Mr. Palfrey, thinking Mr. Freely a little too magnificent in his generosity. Eh, Zavy, come back, exclaimed Jacob, giving his dear brother another hug, which crushed Mr. Freely's features inconveniently against the stale of the pitchfork. Ay, ay, said Mr. Freely, smiling, with every capability of murder in his mind, except the courage to commit it. He wished the bath buns might by chance have arsenic in them. Mother Zinnies, said Jacob, pointing to a glass jar of yellow lozenges that stood in the window. Give em me. David dared not do otherwise than reach down the glass jar and give Jacob a handful. He received them in his smock frock, which he held out for more. They'll keep him quiet a bit at any rate, thought David, and emptied the jar. Jacob grinned and mowed with delight. You're very good to this stranger, Mr. Freely, said Letitia, and then spitefully, as David joined the party at the parlour door, I think you could hardly treat him better if he was really your brother. I've always thought it a duty to be good to idiots, said Mr. Freely, striving after the most moral view of the subject. We might have been idiots ourselves. Everybody might have been born idiots instead of having their right senses. I don't know where they'd have been victual for all of us, then, observed Mrs. Palfrey, regarding the matter in a housewifely light. But let us sit down again and finish our tea, said Mr. Freely. Let us leave the poor creature to himself. They walked into the parlour again, but Jacob, not apparently appreciating the kindness of leaving him to himself, immediately followed his brother, and seated himself, pitchfork grounded, at the table. "'Well,' said Miss Letitia, rising, "'I don't know whether you mean to stay, mother, but I shall go home.' "'Oh, me too,' said Penny, frightened to death at Jacob, who had begun to nod and grin at her. "'Well, I think we had better be going, Mr. Palfrey,' said the mother, rising more slowly. Mr. Freely, whose complexion had become decidedly yellower during the last half-hour, did not resist this proposition. He hoped they should meet again under happier circumstances. "'It is my belief the man is his brother,' said Letitia, when they were all on their way home. "'Nonsense!' said Mr. Palfrey. "'Freely's got no brother.' He's said so many and many a time. He's an orphan. He's got nothing but uncles, leastwise one. What's it matter what an idiot says? What call had Freely to tell lies? Letitia tossed her head and was silent. Mr. Freely, left alone with his affectionate brother Jacob, brooded over the possibility of luring him out of the town early the next morning and getting him conveyed to Gillsbrook without further betrayals. But the thing was difficult. He saw clearly that if he took Jacob himself, his absence, conjoined with the disappearance of the stranger, would either cause the conviction that he was really a relative, or would oblige him to the dangerous course of inventing a story to account for his disappearance, and his own absence at the same time. David groaned. There come occasions when falsehood is felt to be inconvenient. It would, perhaps, have been a longer-headed device if he had never told any of those clever fibs about his uncles, grand and otherwise. For the Palfreys were simple people, and shared the popular prejudice against lying. 
even if he could get jacob away this time what security was there that he would not come again having once found the way oh guineas oh lozenges what enviable people those were who had never robbed their mothers and had never told fibs david had a sleepless night while jacob was snoring close by was this the upshot of travelling to the indies and acquiring experience combined with anecdote he rose at the break of day as he had once before done when he was in fear of jacob and took all gentle means to rouse his fatal brother from his deep sleep he dared not be loud because his apprentice was in the house and would report everything but jacob was not to be roused he fought out with his fist at the unknown cause of disturbance turned over and snored again he must be left to wake as he would david with a cold perspiration on his brow confessed to himself that jacob could not be got away that day mr palfrey came over to grimworth before noon with a natural curiosity to see how his future son-in-law got on with a stranger to whom he was so benevolently inclined he found a crowd round the shop all grimworth by this time had heard how freely had been fastened on by an idiot who called him brother zavy and the younger population seemed to find the singular stranger an unwearying source of fascination while the householders dropped in one by one to inquire into the incident why don't you send him to the workhouse said mr prettyman you'll have a row with him and the children presently and he'll eat you up the workhouse is a proper place for him let his kin claim him if he's got any those may be your feelings mr prettyman said david his mind quite enfeebled by the torture of his position what is he your brother then said mr prettyman looking at his neighbour freely rather sharply all men are our brothers and idiots particular so said mr freely who like many other travelled men was not master of the english language come come if he's your brother tell the truth man said mr prettyman with growing suspicion don't be ashamed of your own flesh and blood mr palfrey was present and also had his eye on freely it is difficult for a man to believe in the advantage of a truth which will disclose him to have been a liar in this critical moment david shrank from his immediate disgrace in the eyes of his future father-in-law mr prettyman he said i take your observations as an insult i've no reason to be otherwise than proud of my own flesh and blood if this poor man was my brother more than all men are i should say so a tall figure darkened the door and david lifting his eyes in that direction saw his eldest brother jonathan on the door sill i'll stay with zavy shouted jacob as he too caught sight of his eldest brother and running behind the counter he clutched david's hard what he is here said jonathan foe coming forward my mother would have no nay as he'd been away so long but i must see after him and it struck me he was very like come after you because we've been talking of you late and where you lived david saw there was no escape he smiled a ghastly smile what is this a relation of yours sir said mr palfrey to jonathan ay it's my innocent little brother sure enough said honest jonathan a fine trouble and cost he is to us and eating and the other things but we must bear what's laid on us and your name's freely is it said mr prettyman nay nay my name's foe i know nothing of freely's said jonathan curtly come he added turning to david i must take some news to mother about jacob shall i take him with me or will you undertake to send him back take him if you can make him loose his hold of me said david feebly is this gentleman here in the confectionery line your brother then sir said mr prettyman feeling that it was an occasion on which format language must be used i don't want to own him said jonathan unable to resist a movement of indignation that had never been allowed to satisfy itself he ran away from home with good reasons in his pocket years ago he didn't want to be owned again i reckon mr palfrey left the shop 
he felt his own pride too severely wounded by the sense that he had let himself be fooled to feel curiosity for further details the most pressing business was to go home and tell his daughter that freely was a poor sneak probably a rascal and that her engagement was broken off mr prettyman stayed with some internal self gratulation that he had never given in to freely and that mr chaloner would see now what sort of a fellow it was that he had put over the heads of older parishioners he considered it due from him mr prettyman that for the interests of the parish he should know all that was to be known about this interloper grimworth would have people coming from botany bay to settle in it if things went on in this way it soon appeared that jacob could not be made to quit his dear brother david except by force he understood with a clearness equal to that of the most intelligent mind that jonathan would take him back to skimmed milk apple dumpling broad beans and pork he had found a paradise in his brother's shop it was a difficult matter to use force with jacob for he wore heavy nailed boots and if his pitchfork had been mastered he would have resorted without hesitation to kicks nothing short of using guile to bind him hand and foot would have made all parties safe let him stay said david with desperate resignation frightened above all things at the idea of further disturbances in his shop which would make his exposure all the more conspicuous you go away again and tomorrow i can perhaps get him to go to gillsbrook with me he'll follow me fast enough i dare say he added with a half groan very well said jonathan gruffly i don't see why you shouldn't have some trouble and expense with him as well as the rest of us but mind you bring him back safe and soon else mother'll never rest on this arrangement being concluded mr prettyman begged mr jonathan foe to go and take a snack with him an invitation which was quite acceptable and as honest jonathan had nothing to be ashamed of it is probable that he was very frank in his communications to the civil draper who pursuing the benefit of the parish hastened to make all the information he could gather about freely common parochial property you may imagine that the meeting of the club at the woolpack that evening was unusually lively every member was anxious to prove that he had never liked freely as he called himself foe was his name was it fox would have been more suitable the majority expressed a desire to see him hooted out of town mr freely did not venture over his door sill that day for he knew jacob would keep at his side and there was every probability that they would have a train of juvenile followers he sent to engage the woolpack jig for an early hour the next morning but this order was not kept religiously a secret by the landlord mr freely was informed that he could not have the jig till seven and the grimworth people were early risers perhaps they were more alert than usual on this particular morning for when jacob with a bag of sweets in his hand was induced to mount the jig with his brother david the inhabitants of the market-place were looking out of their doors and windows and at the turning of the street there was even a muster of apprentices and schoolboys who shouted as they passed in what jacob took to be a very merry and friendly way nodding and grinning in return huzzay david foe how's your uncle was the morning's greeting like other pointed things it was not altogether impromptu even this public derision was not so crushing to david as the horrible thought that though he might succeed now in getting jacob home again there would never be any security against his coming back like a wasp to the honey-pot as long as david lived in grimworth jacob's return would be hanging over him but could he go on living in grimworth an object of ridicule discarded by the palfreys after having revelled in the consciousness that he was an envied and prosperous confectioner david liked to be envied he minded less about being loved his doubts on this point were soon settled the mind of grimworth became obstinately set against him and his viands and the new school being finished the eating-room was closed if there had been no other reason sympathy with the palfreys that respectable family who had lived in the parish time out of mind would have determined all well-to-do people to decline freely's goods 
Besides, he had absconded with his mother's guineas. Who knew what else he had done, in Jamaica or elsewhere, before he came to Grimworth, worming himself into families under false pretenses? Females shuddered. Dreadful suspicions gathered round him. His green eyes, his bow legs had a criminal aspect. The rector disliked the sight of a man who had imposed upon him, and all boys who could not afford to purchase hooted, David Foe, as they passed his shop. Certainly no man would pay anything for the good will of Mr. Freely's business, and he would be obliged to quit it without a peculium so desirable towards defraying the expense of moving. In a few months the shop in the marketplace was again to let, and Mr. David Foe, alias Mr. Edward Freely, had gone. Nobody at Grimworth knew whither. In this way the demoralization of Grimworth women was checked. Young Mrs. Steen renewed her efforts to make light mince pies, and having at last made a batch so excellent that Mr. Steen looked at her with complacency as he ate them, and said they were the best he had ever eaten in his life, she thought less of her baubles and renegades ever after. The secrets of the finer cookery were revived in the breasts of matronly housewives, and daughters were again anxious to be initiated in them. You will further, I hope, be glad to hear that some purchases of drapery made by Pretty Penny, in preparation for her marriage with Mr. Freely, came in quite as well for her wedding with young Towers, as if they had been made expressly for the latter occasion. For Penny's complexion had not altered. The blue always became it best. Here ends the story of Mr. David Foe, confectioner, and his brother Jacob. And we see in it, I think, an admirable instance of the unexpected forms in which the great nemesis hides herself. End of Brother Jacob Read by Lynn Thompson in the Willamette Valley